you had to learn particle physics as well, right? To work at, like you were telling you were telling us about that you did a, you took a course in particle physics. Yeah, I think uh, during uh, so at some point I did one uh, course in particle physics. It wasn't required, but it was just my own curiosity on what I was working on. One of the projects that I was doing was uh, related to track reconstruction, which is basically how do you identify which part which subatomic particles are created uh, at LHC. Uh, and LHC is the Large Hadron Collider, by the way. And uh, what you do is when two particle beams, uh, in our case, protons, or it would be lead ions uh, for heavy, heavy atoms, they are made to collide at very high speeds. This is speed is close, very, very, very close to the speed of light, which is the absolute limit of light. And when those collisions happen, when two protons collide, they break apart and a large amount of subatomic particles are created. We don't even know how many particles are created uh, in trillions easily. And a lot of them recombine with each other because these, this is unstable. All of these subatomic particles are unstable. And when they recombine, they, they follow a specific track. And we have to basically use mathematical methods to try to reconstruct which particle would have left which kind of track because those tracks are left uh, are recorded by sensors that are surrounded around this collision point. So you can think of like uh, if if this this whole thing is uh, a layer of sensors, if there is a collision happening at the center, oh, sorry, uh, if a collision is happening at the center, particles will fly all around in all of 360 degrees, and each of the sensors will record uh, a certain amount of charge that when when it passes, a sensor will record okay one particular charge has passed from this uh, at this particular point. And then you have to try to reconstruct which particle would have crossed which path. And it is a huge mathematical problem. And it is, uh, like it's also a hint, by the way, if you're interested in mathematical side, side definitely mention uh, track reconstruction, vertex reconstruction, flav flavor tagging. This will give you a very good edge in your applications to certain, for example. Yeah. But, but definitely I should know what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did physics for a long time, and even after like doing BSc and MSc, and then taking a particle physics course, mm -hmm. it was brutal. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I was. I remember multiple hard. lectures. Yeah. I was. I was sitting through, and I was like, "This is an alien language. Why mm -hmm. are people writing this notation? It makes no sense." How was it for you to come from engineering background and sitting into a particle physics course? No, you definitely have to start from the beginning. Uh, if you directly dive into field theory, or nothing will make sense. It will be very depressing for you. You will not be make, able to make any progress. The only thing, like for example, what I did was, I sh I didn't have the luxury to study all the subjects of a BSc physics program. I didn't have enough time, nor the nor the patience to study all of that. I just short shortlisted what what is the relevant course, what is a prerequisite to understand this particular subject. So for, for me, the prerequisites were, were few. Uh, I needed to understand linear algebra, probability theory, statistics, all of these things just to get a grasp of quantum mechanics. And from there on, it was easier to go into particle physics. So the basic elementary course in particle physics would not require so much of uh, these new notations. You can always find those notations from the book. And once you have the relevant courses in hand, so for example, I never did any course on relativity. So I have no idea what happens in gravity and, uh, and these things because it was not relevant to my work. And you were mentioned about how hard it is to fly rockets. What's come easy? Flying a rocket or doing a particle physics with having <laughs> like low amount of prerequisites? It is a very, <laughs> it will be a very unfair question if I say that uh, one of the things is harder than the other. Uh, because I, as you said, like in rockets, there are so many things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. in, when you're calculating, when you're calculating something in particle physics, there are so many things that can go wrong. Yeah, in particle and, physics, and again, it's, 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 it's an engineering marvel in itself that uh, there are so many subsystems that are connected with each other and they work in, in conjunction and they are actually working successfully. It's a huge miracle. It's no less than a miracle. Uh, 
even even with a slight deviation in the beams, uh, there could be a huge catastrophe. So if you look into the history of CERN, there has been uh, luckily not so many uh, accidents, but there was one major one just before the first start of LHC. And uh, that led to a huge loss. I mean, there were many superconducting magnets that basically uh, imploded uh, due to, uh, due to uh, engineering issues. And that requires a lot of uh, work uh, across different teams with uh, collaboration with different teams. So it is definitely hard, yeah. I wouldn't underplay it. I would say, yeah, probably particle physics is hard. Okay. So yeah. let me not rephrase it. Theory, not just the theory, the, the experiment stuff is, is actually very yeah. hard. So let me just re so let me rephrase my question. If you if you are given a chance, what will you do? Flying a rocket again from scratch, you have to construct it and then fly it, or sitting through a particle physics course. Yeah, uh, I don't think I can sit through another course <laughs> now. <laughs> that that answers yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I now when when you progress, like when you finish your studies, your way of uh, learning also changes a lot. Uh, earlier, uh, it would make more sense to sit in a class and study and take courses and do that. I still do it, uh, but I don't do it like uh, I don't have the patience to sit through a whole semester uh, to study one particular course. I would rather study uh, whatever is relevant to the current work that I'm doing. So, Amita, speaking mm -hmm. about job, what is currently the nature of your job and how much physics does it involve? So, these days I'm not working a lot with physics. Uh, the, uh, I think the close, the most I was doing physics was I think about a year and a half ago or two years ago about. And that was basically the track reconstruction problem that I mentioned, but I was doing it using a quantum computer. And that required a lot of uh, learning a lot of new things. So even in quantum algorithms, I was working on a very specific kind of problem where, which involved uh, these quantum machine learning techniques, which is not at all machine learning done on quantum computers. It is completely different. And uh, that required more information about information theory techniques and uh, your basics of quantum mechanics on, and your linear algebra, that's it. And the current work, for example, what I'm doing is I built uh, detectors, uh, radiation uh, monitoring detectors. So these devices can uh, are installed all around the sun uh, premises. So it's underground, it's upstairs, it's at every entrance, you can find one device uh, just to monitor background radiation. If there are any accidents, you can, you can monitor that, uh, any new kind of particles that pass through. So we detect all kinds of, kinds of radiation and it is an industry standard device. So CERN is known for LHC, sure, but there are a lot of other things that happens here. For example, if you, uh, if you don't know, uh, the World Wide Web, the WWW that we use, was also developed at CERN. And uh, a lot of new technologies, if you're interested, there's one thing called White Rabbit, which is very interesting. I feel uh, one of my favorite things right now, what's happening here. So you can look into that. So yeah. It doesn't require, it doesn't necessarily require a lot of physics. You know, it depends on which department you're working on. Even if you're an experimental physicist, a lot of the times you'll be troubled with engineering problems than uh, like direct physics problems. Great. So um, now looking back at your journey, overall journey, what would you say was the like breakthrough in your academics, which like opened many opportunities for you? Um, I would say the bachelor's was very interesting as in um, I was like completely into uh, just trying to find what uh, what inspires me. Like I was trying to think of applications. Uh, back then I used to wonder like, yeah, if I can make a rocket then probably I can apply for NASA and at some point uh, it would be possible to go to uh, to space and then like, yeah, Elon Musk is trying to go to build a rocket to Mars and these kind of like just curiosities were enough to inspire me to work and try to find answers to all of this. And uh, a, lot, a lot of this you can find on uh, on the internet as well. So it, it, was, it was definitely the curiosity which drives uh, what you want to work on. And 
when it comes to breakthroughs, I like to quote uh, like uh, Richard Hamming, who was one of the like a giants in in the field of physics, that uh, luck will favor you if you are more prepared. As in, uh, when they say that a uh, lot of great ideas come when you are not paying attention or you are just uh, dreaming, and suddenly there's a, a eureka moment, and then you think of one special technique. But if you look at those ideas and if you analyze the past of those scientists, it, you can say that, yeah, Einstein was just looking at an elevator and he thought of relativity. But if you just look at the time before that, you can see that he actually put in a lot of work to understand his basics, to understand uh, his own field. And that what, that what led, he was so so much consumed with all of these ideas that he, that, that you, that, your subconscious was forced to uh, to come to that idea. So there will be breakthroughs moment, but it won't happen that yeah, suddenly you're not putting in the effort and one day you're in a shower and yeah, yeah suddenly, yeah, here you go, yeah. Those kind of things won't happen. Like yeah, you, if you're so much consumed by what you're thinking of or what you're working on, then it will happen. Great. So uh, talking about your bachelor's and fundamentals, is there any particular project, rather an accomplishment mm -hmm. uh, in your bachelor's, which you are like really proud of? Uh, like, okay, this is what I'm like proud of. Good yeah. thing. Is there anything like that? Oh, bachelor's like uh, I don't know all of the projects are like super interesting. There were so like so many uh, like the team was like the teamwork was especially uh, very very nice. Uh, the rocket project I told you was very interesting. I mean, it, taught, it taught me a lot of things to, uh, just to manage, just to build our own systems because we used to stay nights at the lab and a lot of things were done back then. I was I'm like super happy about that project. And uh, yeah, the publication was a very interesting one. That was the first time uh, I went through the process of what publishing is and uh, it still gets citations. So I'm like super psyched about it. Like back then I had no ideas like to how does publication work or what's its, rele its relevance. And uh, yeah, the, there was one component that was very interesting for, for like it could be patented and like my department said, that uh, yeah, maybe you should apply this for a patent, and they they did it for me. Like I didn't do anything in that. They they if you can develop something that interesting, and they talk to your professors and your department head, and like talk talk with them if that can be patentable or something. And uh, if it it is, then it is an expensive process in India, and but they will cover everything. The whole patent process was. Oh, but you also have to be very very careful with who you reveal those details with because they would want a share of the pie of the credits. I mean, that's uh, that's a different story, to be honest. Like patent laws is, uh, is a very complicated thing. I would definitely suggest to like keep people who you trust in the loop. Uh, totally, totally. I've seen it happening, heard it happening to a lot of people because patent is a pretty big deal, right? They wouldn't otherwise like sponsor it. It's a lot of paperwork to the fact that they want to do it by themselves means yeah. that it means a lot to them. So you'd be want to be very, very careful with uh, yeah. uh, who will take credits for that. To be honest, like at that, at that point, I was, I had no, uh, intention of uh, creating an application of that pattern but it was just good to know that yeah, this is something unique and uh, it can be patented but if you have something in mind uh, that you think you can patent and uh, so patent is for protection it's not something that gives you money it will uh, prevent other people from using that idea without paying you the the, the due credit and uh, especially with, uh, it comes with different, and patent is no easy uh, thing to maintain because it costs you money to maintain it for many years. And if you are, for example, your market is in the US, you need to get a US patent as well. So all of these things matter and probably a patent attorney is the best person who can like go through all these details. And you can reveal the details to your uh, like colleagues who are especially who you're collaborating with who you think will be uh, what who are relevant to this project but yeah definitely try to keep things uh, like um, closed until you have some sort of uh, 
uh, until you have actually uh, contacted this uh, the patent office and uh, fi filed the first application. After that, you can start uh, sharing. If if you can go back in time, with all your life experience right now and wisdom you have collected over the years, if you can go back in time and mentor yourself, the yourself from the UG days, from day one, what will be the advice or wisdom you will lay upon that dude? Like, wh what will you tell that this is something you should pay more attention to? And what's something you're like, don't do this. This is not worth doing. Oh man, this is this is very easy for me. I mean, to be honest, I would, uh, I can I can share this. My my GPA was eight point five. Uh, like uh, collectively, I think uh, towards the end of my bachelor's, it was around eight point nine or something. But that was it. And I have faced so many rejections just because it was an eight point five, not a nine point five. Uh, I would definitely tell my younger self that yeah, stop messing around. Just. Uh, put in put in the hard work i know like the very first thing probably you'll hear in universities yeah marks will not matter and all of these things they will not matter if you're not planning to go into academia or research kind of thing if uh, if you're going for uh, not even that if you're going into industry it won't matter a lot what you have done what you're currently working on or your connections all of those things matter a lot but if you're going directly into uh, in academia, for example, if you have a mindset of applying for a PhD right after your bachelor's, then it will matter a lot. Like I have applied to many universities, and when I see the people who actually took, uh, who actually got selected to those universities, uh, then I realized, oh shit, okay, I, I don't have a chance against them. Like the, those people were like uh, MIT, ten out of ten, or like four out of four GPA. And the number of uh, vacancies were five or six in a department, and they're taking like oh, one from Berkeley, one from MIT, one from Michigan, and all of them have perfect four out of four GPA. So yeah, it, it, it would make things much easier on yourself uh, if you have a better GPA. Mm -hmm. That was a serious reality check. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to worry. Like, yeah, that uh, you can definitely make up for uh, the time lost. You don't have to like dwell into the past. There, there are many ways to do it. You can uh, get good internships. You can get uh, work on different projects. So, a lot of my colleagues who went into research, uh, if they didn't have a good GPA, they basically spent. Uh, one year working with a professor to build the research profile and they actually contributed a lot so the best way is to because if you're actually getting a good gpa that means you're actually putting in the effort to learn the material and you're you're definitely preparing yourself for the research journey right so and if you can manage a good publication in uh, even after your bachelor's, if you spend one year doing the research, and if you can, if you know which are the good respectable journals or a conference in your in your particular domain, if you are able to publish a good paper, then yeah, you're more or less set. Yeah, it wouldn't uh, hurt a lot. Great. Uh, so a very serious question that you get asked the other day: How okay. close you are creating a black hole? <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> Oh, oh wow this is <laughs> that never gets old but uh, <laughs> the thing is that uh, uh, how would I say black holes are not a very interesting uh, objects in the universe <laughs> so what we do currently is like we don't create black holes but we do certainly simulate them um, there are many models there are many theoretical models on how a black hole behaves or what what is uh, what is in, inside of a black hole those kind of things and a lot of them are theory which comes if you have heard of uh, ads cft correspondence uh, these kind of theories like they kind of try to predict uh, how a black hole uh, behaves right and then you can actually create experiments to simulate those uh, effects so there was a recent paper from uh, Google research. So Google X is a spe special wing who basically does uh, these kind of simulations. And um, if you're really interested, there is a professor, uh, Professor Scott Aronson, who has written a very good uh, explanation on his blog about how uh, 
uh, what this experiment was and what it what what it was trying to simulate. At CERN, what we do is we try to recreate the conditions what happened right after the Big Bang, like fraction of a second after the Big Bang, what happened. So it is you can basically think when two protons are smashing, most fundamental particles who that were created right after the big, after the Big Bang are created in these collisions. And we are trying to uh, understand the properties of this and what led to the first atoms, hydrogen and helium to be created. And there was a big gap between that. So there are different experiments. There is one experiment that is dedicated especially to study these effects. So for example, one experiment is called ALICE, which is, stands for a large ion collider experiment and which studies these uh, <clears throat> the, a special uh, phase after the creation of the universe where when there was only quark gluon plasmas. And the experiment is designed to study that. So that certainly means that like they are creating the conditions. We don't know for certain because that is not something we can observe, but that just means that those, uh, those circumstances are being created at the detector, but they are so quick that they uh, disintegrate and they are completely lost. Uh, in a fraction of a second. And that is the moment we try to capture and understand the properties from the aftermath of those uh, events. There's one very interesting experiment called AD. Uh, it's a short form for antimatter deaccelerator. And uh, that experiment concerns developing of antimatter particles, which is, I feel like it's much more interesting than black holes because black holes are what like this, no energy there. Just there's this just there there's no application but antimatter has huge applications and uh, people are here are able to collect uh, antimatter antiproton particles to be exact they are able to collect it they are able to store it for now a couple of seconds and which has huge application applications in an energy sector so you can use them for yeah powering your power plants it's a clean energy source these kinds of things are interesting uh, how different do you think it is working in the industry than what you expected in your academics? Like, for example, when you were in your bachelor's or master's, you probably would have thought, okay, this is what I'll be doing when I'll be in the industry, like making the change. And how different it is now when you're actually working in the industry? Uh, yeah, so I didn't have much idea. Like, to be honest, I didn't even realize when I came into, uh, started working more of an, in, of, from an industry perspective. Now, let me put this in context because CERN definitely is a uh, research organization, but the thing is we have to deliver a lot of things that have to be, uh, industry ready as in, uh, it has to be put into an experiment that works with the precision or with the safety levels of, of any industrial complex. And the kind of work that we do, uh, like for example, we are employed for creating these detectors, which will work, uh, which we have deadlines to meet. So all of these things comes with the industry kind of uh, environment around. So, so the style of working changes from academia. As well. We have students, we have PhD students, we have professors who visit often. There are, the there are theoretical departments who work with the creativity or the flexibility of academics. But on our side for experimental physics or for uh, safety engineering or for detector development, we have to be more uh, to be able to deliver on time. We have to be able to explore all the viable options to uh, that are available to us. So we we have contacts with uh, different vendors in industry. We directly contact them. For example, if we need something very specific, we'll talk to people uh, uh, directly in industry. So if we need, for example, there is a company called Xilinx that creates these FPGAs that I was talking about. And if we need something very specific to our needs, and we say that yeah, we need a thousand units of these, we'll work with them and we'll try to uh, communicate our needs so that they can create a custom board if necessary for us. So, so all of these things uh, takes time and it takes a certain amount of uh, commitment, let's say, <laughs> that yeah, you have to deliver, there is no chance, otherwise a lot of people will be uh, like really upset. So in our case, it's basically the time when uh, the experiment starts. So all of the, these different groups have to be ready 
uh, at the date we have decided that, okay, we'll start the experiment at this point. So last year around July, mid of July was the date and uh, it was a very stressful time because uh, imagine like uh, one of the departments where our detectors are not ready. And so that means 50 other departments, their works will be delayed. So that thing uh, doesn't happen. After that, how much time you are left with to develop your own ideas and your own research methodology? And yeah, so that this is uh, in this scenario, Sun is a very good place. As in, uh, we are not tied to just one thing that we are working on. I mean, if like there's always a provision that if you are absolutely not interested in, your, in what you're working, you can try to talk to other groups and try to move into a different group. But usually when you join a, a particular group, then you know that you, you want to work on that, right? And even within that group, there is a lot of provision for growth. You can, uh, you are more than encouraged. You're not just allowed, you're encouraged to talk to other groups who are working on, uh, on different things. So in our case, for example, we, we develop detectors for radiation monitoring and all of these things. But we talk to people from computer security because the devices that we install uh, are managed within an intranet uh, that is created within CERN and which has a lot of security uh, requirements that we have to meet. Uh, so we can just, can't just put our devices and be like, yeah, it's safe. No. So we talk to people from uh, from computer security. We talk to people from machine learning because we, we do predictive, something called predictive maintenance, which is basically using machine learning to, uh, to predict when our devices can fail. So all of these things can happen. And uh, we are encouraged to talk to other people. Uh, for example, our group is heavily involved in formal verification, which is another fancy way of saying that yeah, your devices cannot fail and you have to prove it mathematically. So which requires a lot of uh, this mathematics thing. And since we are doing radiation, we are definitely talking to physicists. There's a lot of simulations for radiations as well. So yeah, there's a lot of interdepartmental collaboration. And you are encouraged to do that. You are encouraged to talk to people within CERN, outside CERN, uh, in industry, in academia, whatever you like. So, as long as you're doing your work. Yeah, your, your work, your responsibility shouldn't be lagging. That's it. Right. Uh, Amita, related to that, the other day we were talking about how important it is for scientists and engineers to do the interdisciplinary work. And uh, from my experience, I can say that even at bachelor's, most of the students are rigid about their thought process that, okay, they want to go in the observational field or they just want to go in the pure theoretical field, just do the calculations and not do the coding part. So uh, how significant is that interdisciplinary part for the overall research? So interdisciplinary is something that basically uh, fell on our laps. We are a generation when uh, we have to carry a lot of things that have been done in the past. As in, uh, if you have heard the phrase uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, right? That means you are building upon theories that are, have already been developed. If you go 50 years uh, in the past, a lot of new theories hadn't been developed. So you had one way of solving particular uh, task, but now it's not the case. A lot of these applications that are coming up uh, are very interdisciplinary. If you can't, it, I wouldn't say you can't just stay in one lane and you, you can't progress. That's not the case. You can still do it, but it will help you just to see what kind of, um, new, not just applications or new theories you can develop uh, just by being a little interdisciplinary. I'll give you one example that uh, I have a friend uh, uh, who is uh, who is a postdoc in the Atlas group. And he's a, he has been uh, an, a particle physicist all his life. But in his postdoc, most of his work concerns um, writing Python programs, uh, developing machine learning techniques, for the problem that I was telling you about uh, earlier, the, uh, the track reconstruction problem. It's not an easy problem. A lot of people are working it all around the globe. So he he's not supposed to be knowing programming, right? But the, the way the, these guys write program, it's it's as efficient or as good as any uh, any computer engineer or computer science programmer can, 
can write a program. Plus, you these programs run on special supercomputers. So you have to run these programs on these GPU clusters. So you need to understand how G, how a supercomputers work, how you program those things. So programming is sort of it's very important for you to know. I have many friends who are actually working in biochemistry and uh, in one friend in chemical biology, and these people have worked. They are they are still they have just started their PhD, so they have just finished their masters, and they have never programmed before in their life. And they they still tell me that they even they need uh, a knowledge of R programming or MATLAB or Python just to do their graphs to analyze the data because there's so much. So you'll be doing yourself a favor by uh, by learning. So programming is sort of a second language you can think of it. Uh, like if you're a physicist, I would say like, yeah, definitely learn C. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, not C, Python. Uh, C plus plus. They have a lot of uh, physicists learn C plus plus because C plus plus is much more efficient with Python, ninety times more efficient than Python to Python to be exact. So, but it is much harder to learn than C uh, than Python. So yeah, definitely learn Python for analyzing your data, for uh, for plotting, for all these things. Uh, but if you're actually developing a new technologies or new algorithms, yeah, go for learning new things. It will help. So an absolutely must for any undergrad student would be to know at least one programming language, right? If they yeah. are in it. Yeah. I mean, one pro Python, if you know Python, you're, you're really good. Uh, if you're if you're an electronics or computer engineer, uh, computer science engineer, the list is much longer. But if you're not in, in, in these Indeed. particular branches, then yeah, you're good with Python and probably C plus plus. Great. I think on that note, yeah, Nachiket, do you have any questions? Go ahead. Mm, we have time to cover them. They are not really getting. If you have time to cover questions, then I have few, but they are not that important. We can skip right to them. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Amitabh, do you have time? Yeah, that's uh, I'm okay. And, yeah. Okay. So speaking of friends, I assume that many people you went to UG with, with went right into industries. How how much your experience being an engineer in Europe is different than their experience being an engineer in India? How much is industry different there compared to US? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good question. Uh, in so my case is a little special because special not in a good way for me, unfortunately, because industry how it works is uh, they use a standard set of tools, and uh, usually it's easier. Like for example, if I if I was working in one uh, an industry like in my case, let's say NXP or uh, any semiconductor company, I would have been working. I would be using those tools which those skill set is transferable from one company to the next CERN is special in this sense because a lot of the times we develop our own uh, our own tools from scratch so for example even for networking there are industry standard protocols we don't use uh, that uh, we have developed our own from scratch we use c to develop that we have uh, we use uh, like our own custom software which does sometimes it follows the industry standards. Sometimes we develop our own standards and it can, the skills are not directly transferable. So you have to find some overlap when you're going into industry. So if I apply to uh, a company in India for uh, for a job, then I'll have to first do a little bit of research and like my best bet would be that uh, my basics from my bachelor's are strong. And uh, since I have worked on some devices so I can uh, work on uh, the applications that they are wanting me to work on. It's not directly transferable, but yeah, if you're like, if you're working in an industry in Europe and if you're moving to another industry in India, it's not so much different here. You won't find so much uh, problem. No, like my question was how much when they, uh, when your friends from UG tell you about their experience as working as an engineer in India, and mm -hmm. then you have your own experience. Oh, okay. How much different is it? No, no, it's not. It's not that much different, to be honest. Uh, in in India, and 
um, in electronics or even physics, uh, to be honest, uh, we are getting there. I mean, in, not in not in the not in competence. Competitively, we are like really doing very well. Uh, in fact, in many domains, I feel like uh, what what is being done in India is 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 much better than uh, the kind of progress that is being done in Europe. Uh, in the fronts that we are getting there is, for example, semiconductor manufacturing. Semiconductors is it it is very expensive to make. Um, I'll just quote a figure that uh, like uh, that we recently got from uh, a company called TSMC. It charges uh, two hundred fifty thousand for one wafer uh, to develop a chip. One wafer which has could have like uh, nearly a thousand uh, different chips. It costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars just to make one uh, one complete wafer, which is not a figure. And people in universities here are able to pay uh, if you are able to design those kind of things. So in India, we are able to design those things, but just because uh, this pay uh, this thing, uh, the cost of manufacturing is so high, it is not uh, not a lot of people are able to afford it. Like IIT Madras, IIT Bombay, these people, they definitely send their chips, they're able to afford it, but it is not something that is being able uh, in reach of everybody. So a lot of the, the times, like my friends who are working in, for example, Intel Bangalore, they, they develop the chips, but the manufacturing part, the, uh, a lot of this thing is done back in, uh, the design is sent back to the US and then the US, they, they manufacture it and yeah, the whole cycle is like kind of broken in this sense. But definitely the work aspect is the same. Yeah. Uh, one more thing, uh, as you are currently into physics, or uh, like, uh, but when you chose engineering, it was engineering that was in your mind. So, what what was your interest in physics when you began about? So it. Um... I would I was I still think of myself first as an engineer. I feel like engineering is uh, much more challenging than being physicist. No offense yeah. to anybody. <laughs> but, uh, Zero offense. Yeah. No, that uh, they both have like very they both are very interesting. I think uh, in physics you you need a very original way of thinking. Uh, in engineering is more like. Uh, it's it's kind of like that meme that like uh, a physicist physicist would admire a phenomena and try to study the nooks and crannies of it, but an engineer would be like, okay, I see this phenomena, but how can I just play around to make it do something else? So that kind of thing is like uh, uh, it's sort of like my interest like originated from the interdisciplinary thing that uh, that we were talking about just a few minutes ago that. Uh, I know electronics. I know to how to develop high-speed electronics. How can I do the like develop high-speed electronics for the particle physics use case or for the quantum computing use case? Uh, so that was basically my curiosity. That that drove me towards doing the, uh, like going into uh, particle physics. And there's a lot of scope for this. Like at some point, if I decide that you no, know, I would like to study a little bit more of uh, quantum physics. But I'll, I'll, I can transition into, for example, uh, developing quantum computers, which would need a lot of physics uh, information uh, background. But more than that, it would need uh, a solid understanding of electronics principles of microwave uh, on how they behave on, on waveguides and all of these things. So that needs a solid electronics background rather than a physics background. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, your you've made switches, right? Like after your uh, engineering, you switch to sort of physics, and then after physics, now you're back into the sound thing. Yeah. So the transitions, how did they come about? Just walk us through. So the transitions are not the, <laughs> the best thing. It would take uh, a little bit of toll on uh, on you because. Uh, Oh, okay, I'm talking about yeah. the aspect of what led you. I mean, your thought process first, and okay. then maybe later of the logistics. Okay, okay. So, um, like I said, like my always, my motivation has been uh, how can I apply these uh, the things that I know to different applications, and I don't care whether it's uh, I, when I'm interested in one topic, I I just try to engage myself on. Uh, I think about the applications. If I'm developing this, what would uh, what would it lead to? 
So that that uh, is very motivating to think about. So if I for the particle physics use case, I was thinking that okay, if I develop uh, uh, high speed systems, then these uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> some noise, but yeah, if I could uh, develop these high speed systems, that would be able to lead to discovery of new subatomic particles or discover new particle theories. So that was very uh, yeah, interesting to. Uh, to transition to learn uh, how physics works so that I can improve on what I'm doing. And that goes uh, at the same time for, for quantum computing, for example. Uh, when I was doing my master's, there, were, there was not much of a provision to do particle physics. We didn't have our own accelerator as such. Uh, there was always a possibility that I can just do my courses and go back to CERN, which was like I all I applied to uh, for a program, but like uh, that's a different story. I didn't uh, accept that position. I was selected for it, but I didn't accept it because I was too much engaged into quantum computing back then. So yeah, that's, uh, the transition happens is basically when when you get excited about a particular topic, and for me, I, I get excited really quickly about many things. Uh, and uh, what is it that uh, okay can you just uh, let me know like what was the first switch that you made like from engineering you moved to like yeah quant quantum or particle physics so from engineering i made, uh, moved to uh, quantum uh, like briefly i've had it during the summer studentship i had a stint with particle physics so uh, during my masters i was working in quantum computing and all throughout my quantum computing uh, curriculum, I was curious about how can I combine these two things. This was a very uh, like let's uh, if I uh, can I develop a quantum algorithm that can help uh, with uh, these problems that we have the computational problems that we have in particle physics because that is something I know. I there are a lot of physics things that happens here, but I don't know all of them. So definitely I can't do much about it. But the things that I know, I can do a lot uh, there, right? So that was the thing that basically brought me, okay, let's uh, try to find a parallel between, an overlap between uh, this, uh, the quantum computing and particle physics. So the first ever conference was held at CERN on, uh, uh, which was called quantum computing for high energy physics. Uh, you can look it up. It was around uh, 2018 or 19, I think. Uh, yeah, two, November, 2018, they, they held this conference. And I actually came here. Again, in after 2017, I, I paid my own expenses. I came here. I knew a couple of people. I got in touch with, uh, I, I directly wrote to the guy who, the, I shouldn't say the guy, uh, uh, the person who was, who was, uh, who arranged this conference. He is a very senior person. And uh, uh, I basically wrote to him and told, uh, asked him if I could come in one day earlier. And uh, I sat, went to his office, talked to him, uh, shared my ideas and what are his ideas uh, so all of this led to uh, one thing after the next. I met the professor who would later become my supervisor uh, at Berkeley National Lab uh, at this conference. And the project was exactly this. How can you use quantum computing to uh, solve problems in particle physics? So that's how you connect, start connecting the dots that how uh, you transition. It, it was kind of going with the flow for me. So yeah, didn't have like two to it wasn't much of a harsh transition, I would say. And what is it that you're currently looking at? So currently I'm really, uh, I'm actually wrapping up my projects here. I'm thinking of what to do next. Uh, I'm uh, already thinking of going into a PhD program or uh, there are opportunities here. I'm developing uh, a kind of project of my own that I think can be useful uh, as a startup. So all of those things are uh, going on uh, at the same time and uh, it is a huge logistical problem and like hopefully in some time i'll be able to figure all of it tell me more about that thing you're working on um it's uh, it's kind of an early uh, phase uh, thing but uh, around 2009 2021 sorry to around 2019 uh, there was uh, there is a group uh, in in the US uh, at the University of San Francisco. There's another group uh, at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. They were first able to demonstrate uh, how can you restore uh, 
abilities in a pa uh, paralyzed person through using brain machine interfaces. And uh, when those papers came out, they first showed the viable uh, means of how you can develop uh, algorithms and systems that, or, or, or brain machine interfaces that can be actually used for uh, human trials. And that is the thing. Uh, currently I'm working on these systems that can make that process computationally easier. We are trying to focus on uh, power efficiency, on, on uh, computational, uh, computational performance, and we are developing our own integrated circuits that can uh, help uh, understand these brain machine interfaces and understand the, the signals that we get from the human brain and try to decode them and try to, uh, try to make useful applications out of them. And we have like a, a strategy to do this. Uh, to do this, uh, we're using very uh, a niche ways of developing these systems. So yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's an early stage, but yeah, it would take some time. But we'll have a demonstration about that as well soon. Right, right. That's very exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for the Nachiket Rimsha? Yeah, I guess not. Nachiket? Yeah. Uh, not from my side. Oh, yeah. Thanks for speaking, Rimsha. I, <laughs> I thought you'd just, <laughs> you'd just remain eye candy really? for the interview, but yeah, thanks for breaking my myth. <laughs> I think we can wrap that. Uh, right. Amitabh, uh, any like keynote, takeaway notes, anything like yeah. something to quote? <laughs> I mean, it's, I, just, I would say just, uh, yeah, I think the one thing that, uh, like, maybe I can say this. Um, so I have some experience on how uh, just traveling around meeting people and all my colleagues that I see that we take uh, in India, like we take life uh, either very seriously or like we just don't um, like worry too much about it. And I think the best way is to take a middle lane. Uh, it's it's okay to take some time out. It's okay to uh, relax a little bit and explore like a uh, different kind of uh, interest that you have. Like we don't really go for that, uh, those sort of things. And I see in Europe, for example, like uh, people take some time off, like it, it's okay. And uh, probably they have the, the luxury here to, uh, to do that, but uh, it, I think it, it we can we can still uh, like do a lot of things by giving us some mental space or a time out or just to work on our mental health and physical health as well and uh, that helps in the long run as well oh yeah I remember this like in one of our college uh, alumni uh, meeting or something uh, yeah. Infosys founder Narayana Muthi came and he said this thing that India I mean, I, he said that I agree still that India is predominantly middle class. Just for them, getting That's... anxieties and something is the way out of like poverty or Indeed. middle class at least. Indeed. Yeah. So the, the, you can't really expect them to like follow the passion and all. But still, yeah, I mean, there are yeah. a lot of people yeah. who can, who can afford to do that. But yeah. still, are not doing it. <laughs> At least yeah, you don't they should to, be. <laughs> you don't have to spend thousands of euro going, uh, right. like thousands of going skiing or learning all of these things. But yeah, you can you can always go running and like explore. You can do something like forest. You camp. could take a year or two off and then, like think for yourself, or even throughout. Like you could think of other options. It's not necessary that you have to take the deadbeat route. I would, is... I would, I, yeah, I would actually take that with a grain of salt because. Uh, it's not good, especially in academia or even in the industry, if you take a, a break that is too long. So oh, okay. uh, at some point, you'll have to justify what were you doing after uh, if you took this break. So if you are actually taking that break, uh, then have something planned. Like uh, a friend of mine is uh, taking a break and he wants to learn mountaineering. And that is useful. That is a useful life skill. I can actually give you an example, like one of our colleagues here, I can actually call him a colleague because we directly work together. And uh, he is a systems engineer. His group is uh, called systems, like it's a huge group. And uh, 
he has a, he's a polish guy and he studied uh, he did his phd he's a group leader here and uh, he also is a mountaineer like he climbs all these mountains he has been to nepal many times to climb all these uh, huge mountains uh, in himalayas he uh, climbs mountains here in alps and all of this comes uh, at uh, like he has this physical strength and this mental strength to uh, conquer all of these feats right and plus he is also a scientist here at sun he's a full time scientist by the way and most recently he is now an astronaut last year he was selected uh, by the european space agency as into the astronaut reserve which was more than a year long process more than 5000 people were uh, shortlisted from that and out of that 20 people were selected and when they select for people for this astronaut program they they shortlist based on all of these criteria your physical health on your endurance your preparedness your technical skills so you never know all of when all of this will come uh, come together you won't be able to see this when you're doing it right now but when this will happen you'll be able to actually look back and see okay this is how how it happened so if you're passionate about something yet don't think that yeah this will lead to something something there's a physicist uh, who played i i'm sorry I, i'm not a music guy but uh, uh, if you know the band queen of course you know Yeah, he was a lead singer and i think he did guitarist guitarist yeah, yeah lead yeah. guitarist and he, he did the, music in like dust astronomical dust yeah and he, he was working he was active a, he's an active physicist he still works in the, in the physics domain so he is an astrophysicist yes. and and i think about your astronaut friend i think yeah i, I connected with him on linkedin you told me his name or something and Oh yeah, I'm. I'm look forward to interview him someday. <laughs> Probably when he's <laughs> that would be lovely because yeah, getting to astronomy. Uh, I mean, becoming astronaut is quite a big thing, and people from physics domain we have a lot of them here. Yeah, 